the labyrinth in the strict sense that it's not whether we're saved, but how. And the how question is much, much more interesting and is what propels us forward. And I'm going to focus this evening on the paradiso, on the paradise, um, partly because as this 700th year has unfolded, um, I've been very struck and at times shocked by how swiftly when various people, journalists and presenters in the media um, have turned to a programme, say on the Divine Comedy, and they've almost before they've begun um, said, look, we can get something out of the Inferno and the Purgatorio perhaps makes some sense, but the Paradiso we can't understand. And it's sort of dismissed and put in a, a bucket marked medieval and uh, not understandable now. Um, I mean, in the New Statesman, this reached an extent, in the New Statesman, there was even an article written by a, you know, an, an academic with two lines where he remarked, scholars debate what the Divine Comedy is about. Some have even suggested it has religious intent, um, which, you know, was quite shocking. I, I laughed and then I was shocked and thought, my goodness, you know, this is in a very leading journal and, and that's kind of where we've got to with it. Um, it can also be um, regarded, particularly the parodies, even by people that are otherwise sympathetic, as somehow too intellectual, um, not understandable. And I do, I do have sympathy with this because I remember when we did uh, the reading group with Jeremy. Um, when it came to the Paradiso, it felt like at the time maybe there were impenetrable blocks to me, at least, when it came to the Paradiso, particularly this business of the the planetary heavens and so on. And I. Um, I did a physics degree as an undergraduate, and I just thought maybe this has um, become a barrier now. Um, but luckily for me, I was, you know, kind of compelled to keep at it. And I think an interpretation has opened up now, which I want to present. Um, it's not actually a discarded image, much as I respect C.S. Lewis and all the work which he did, and of course, the deep way that he was influenced by Dante. If you know Michael Wood's work, you'll know um, that in his book, Planet Narnia, he is persuaded that Lewis didn't actually give up on the discarded image of the medieval cosmology, but um, secretly conveyed it in the seven Narnia stories, each one carrying the, um, the spirit and the felt sense of what it might be like to be in one of these planetary heavens. Um, but, you know, Dante even tells us that he's for now and not just 700 years ago. Um, one of the things which I discovered as I engage with some of the scholarship, and I should perhaps just say that I'm really an amateur when it comes to um, the Divine Comedy, not an academic. Um, I don't even have the Italian to read it in the Italian, I, I fear. Um, but um, as I try to wrestle with some of the scholarship, one of the little facts that stood out to me is that Dante was the first Italian, at least, to use the word modern, moderno, in the Purgatorio. And um, he was on the cusp of our consciousness, not, I think, at the culmination of the medieval mind, as he's often presented. Um, he is very clear to his first readers that they must follow him closely. But he's very clear that we too can follow him closely. He writes for the future, he writes for now. He writes for what was just beginning to emerge in what's sometimes called the first industrial revolution of the 14th century. You know, Florence had uh, created the florin and was beginning to put together the banking system that enabled so much of the modern world for good and for ill. Um, mercantilism was firmly part of life Dante and St Francis's fathers were very successful merchants um, and so that way of life was beginning to shape people's consciousness again for good and for ill fostering a keener sense of the individual in say the Franciscan movements and also the Beguine movements um, of his period um, but of course for ill as well with the alienation that that brings to as Barfield so um, clearly articulated, the two go together for us. We step back into ourselves, um, potentially just dis to discover more, but because first we feel we've lost what we might have had before. 
So let's look again at the great journey of the Divine Comedy. I'm going to make a few remarks about the Inferno, a few about the Purgatorio, but come to the Paradiso and dwell as fully as I can in the time we have upon that this evening. That's when knowledge, as well as love, are truly satisfied. And if we struggle to enter the Paradiso as Dante presents it, then we're going to struggle in all sorts of other ways, too, collectively, as well as individually. Um, but first, I'll show, I hope, the first slide. I guess it's familiar to many people. You've got the inverted cone of the Inferno Ooh. there at the bottom um, that becomes the mountain of Mount Purgatorio, Mount Purgatory, um, going up. And then you've got there the, the seven planetary spheres that are added to by three more domains, the constellations, the fixed stars, then the prima mobile, and then finally the Empyrean at the top there. So that's a kind of route map um, for where we're going to be headed. But first of all, just a couple of comments on the Inferno. Because I think one of the things that Dante discovers after he's woken up in the dark woods midway through the course of our life, as he puts it, um, and then begins the descent, is that people in this infernal place, which is at once, this becomes clear very quickly too, is at once a state of mind and a part of reality, um, is that they're obsessed with the past and the future. And because they're obsessed with the past and the future, they're unable to change. And that is their condemnation. That is what Dante must see and experience keenly if he is to know how to change. And I just wanted to make a remark about a canto that is certainly to my mind one of the hardest to read now. And that is the canto where he meets the prophet Muhammad and Muhammad's um, cousin Ali. And um, it's deep down in the inferno, it's a long way into the journey in the place called Malabolgia, as Dante puts it, in one of the Bolgia, one of these ditches. And it's the ditch where in Inferno 101, a kind of introduction to the Divine Comedy, you'll be told they meet the schismatics. And Dante sees the prophet Muhammad there because in the medieval mind, the prophet might well have been a cardinal even who wanted to be pope and wasn't able to become pope and so led his followers off into the schism um, that um, we now call Islam. And, you know, this is really painful actually to read because it's a brutal depiction of the prophet and Ali. And it really makes you wrestle so when I first started to try and engage with this canto, it made me have to descend as well in my mind um, with the brutality of the image. You know, everyone in the schismatic Bolger is depicted as being torn asunder, um, rent by devils, um, split from head to foot, mir mirroring the schism that they were said to have brought about in their life. And I wonder what on earth can I make of this canto? But then I realized that in order to enter this infernal place, Dante's mind has to be aligned with the infernal place as well. And so he himself is seeing in a spirit of schism. And I think that the insight that begins to emerge when you wrestle with what that might be about is that he is seeing with literal eyes. He's losing the symbolic he's losing because he's quite far down in the inferno the divine point of view and so sure enough he sees Muhammad there and this is in spite of how much Dante the poet would have known he was in debt to Islam um, these sophisticated journeys into the afterlife within Western Christianity are deeply inspired by the prophet's own night journey a very sophisticated journey into the afterlife known in the Islamic tradition. He um, later, as we'll also see this evening, meets other Islamic philosophers who deeply inspired him as well. 
but he's lost all that in this infernal state. He's become what we would now call a fundamentalist. And in the wonderful way that the inferno, as well as the paradiso and the purgatorial begin to open up to you when you risk entering their state of mind, even in the dark place, is that you might also note that it's in the same canto that Dante uses this word contrapasso. Um, he uses it once in the whole of the Inferno, in this place of literalism and fundamentalism. And you begin to think, wait a minute, I thought the contrapasso was sort of describing the whole thing, like this idea that the punishment fits the crime. And then you think, but what was Dante doing by only actually using it once and using it in this particular place? And then the other figure, which is so memorable in this canto, that he meets is Bertrand de Born, who's the character that has had his head cut off and is walking, carrying his head like a lantern, seeing only by his own light. That's how narrow the vision of this place has become. And Dante's entered this narrow vision. And so it's by risking really exposing yourself to the full ferocity of all these images that you begin to see that these characters that are stuck in the past, obsessed with the future, have also entered the tunnel vision of only being able to see by their own light. They've become literalists, they've become fundamentalists, they've lost the divine light. And that is what Dante is risking being exposed to now as well, so he can see it and know it deeply within himself. So that even though he knew he was deeply in debt to the Prophet Muhammad and the Islamic traditions um, that, uh, that, that, that he gave rise to, that he seeded and, and, and gave birth to in the world. Um, he fails to know that in this moment. Um, he fails to know what Rumi so beautifully captured in his very well-known phrase about flowing down deeper and deeper into wider circles of being. That's lost in this moment and Dante must see that, but he does see it. And this brings us to the wonderful climax of the Inferno. And I say wonderful adv advisedly because you'll know that they approach Lucifer frozen in the lake on the floor of hell, this place where being almost tips out of being altogether and hence being depicted as frozen. It's as far from divine light as you can get without just disappearing out of existence. And yet Virgil says to Dante in this moment, not, okay, we've seen it, let's turn our backs, walk out, and now for the good news. Virgil says, no, we must climb onto the very body of Lucifer. And that's the way that things can change. That is this flicker of light, even in this darkest place, that is never quite extinguished. And so Dante and Virgil are able to make this turnaround on the very body of Lucifer, the angel who was closest to God, the angel of light, who's tumbled almost out of existence itself. The divine light actually hasn't been extinguished. It's one of the clues I think Dante is giving us that he is understanding Christianity as a universal religion. It's one of the ways of understanding that all will be saved. The question is not whether, it's this question of how. And you only begin to get some intimation of how if you risk entering these dark places. Descent and ascent are so deeply linked. So Dante, I think, has seen that the now matters. We must try and free ourselves from obsessions with the past and the future. The now matters. And it's in purgatory to make a comment about the purgatory that why the now matters starts to become clearer. And in short, the answer that he finds with what to do with this sense of now is to ask yourself who you are and to ask yourself who you are by bringing the divine light to yourself and seeing what it illuminates. And this know thyself would nowadays, I think, be called the non-dual path. Um, and as the Divine Comedy has opened up to me more and more, I think it's one of the greatest expressions within the Christian tradition of what is now known as the non-dual path through this question asking, who am I? You'll know that when they first 
are in purgatory on the slopes of Mount Purgatory. They meet various souls and groups of individuals who have died and are, are sort of wandering around in various states of mind, not quite knowing what to do next. Um, they, they have a sense of the now, um, but they're not quite sure what it means. And it's not really for Dante until he reach, reaches the threshold of purgatory pop proper, um, the three steps and the angel that guards the threshold to the first terrace. And I think Dante begins to get a sense. And he's got this sense because just before reaching the first threshold, they spent their first night on Mount Purgatory. And he's had this dream in which he sees Jupiter swooping down, abducting Ganymede and taking the beautiful youth to stand at his side. It's an image of rape, really, certainly of lustful possession. And the canto is full of other images of lust, rape, possessiveness, the way that Eros can go so wrong. But when he wakes, shocked by this image, which is inside himself, which is part of himself somehow, Virgil tells him that something else has been happening at the same time, which is that St. Lucy has appeared, one of the three heavenly ladies that her, her are looking after him alongside Beatrice and the Virgin Mary herself. Lucy has appeared and carried him that little bit further up the mountain, kind of launching him to the threshold and therefore on his journey up Mount Purgatory proper. And um, Dante's got to hold these two sides to himself um, because you know in the medieval and ancient understanding you can only know something if it resonates to some extent inside yourself he's got to risk holding these two elements alongside each other not wanting to as it were cut off the, the perverse eros which is active inside him because that would risk him losing the divine eros which can carry him up Mount Purgatory, as Lucy has shown him. And that's, I think, is what goes on really up the terraces of Mount Purgatory, that the various souls they meet are looking at themselves in their fullness in order that they can become the fullness that's required to reach the union with the divine again. You know, so on the so-called terrace of the proud. Um, it's, it's in this word pride that we still use that pride is a good thing. It carries a certain kind of dignity, as well as reminding of us of the risks of vainglory. Um, but the individuals there know because they have hope, they see the light, they see the sunrise every day, they see the stars at night, that if they can tolerate looking at themselves in all this complexity and confusion and pain, but that's the way to becoming all that they are and so resonating with all that is the divine light itself and by the time dante reaches eden and virgil crowns and mitres him lord of himself i think that's what dante has fully accepted and adopted he's become established in being able to look at himself in the round and it's very interesting that in the paradise, it's not that he makes no mistakes. Um, you'll know that in a very high heaven in the prima mobile itself, he actually goes blind at one point, um, which again is quite surprising. It's not that he makes no mistakes and doesn't know, but that he now knows to lean into his mistakes, to what he doesn't understand, to what confuses and bewilders him, because that is the path to the divine. As the Buddhists sometimes say, it's the realization that the obstacles are the way. It's the realization that suffering can be embraced. And one says this so carefully because suffering can be so terrible. But there's a moment when you realize, no doubt with the support of your guides, with the support of divine grace as well, with the support of the light, that somehow, that is the path of transformation. That's what spiritual intelligence can begin to know and understand, to make a reference to the title for this evening's talk. You know, it's not like the intelligence that drives artificial intelligence. 
that must always say whether something's one or the other. It's not like emotional intelligence, which can become confused and overwhelm us as much as lift us and give us peak experiences. It's not even like moral intelligence, um, which struggles with the meaning of suffering because it's quite rightly abhorred by suffering very often and cries out for the good. But spiritual intelligence is what can help us to embrace and say yes to everything. And so begin the journey into paradise once we become established in that. So now let's turn to the paradise and see a little more of how this unfolds for Dante. Here's one of Botticelli's wonderful images. Um, he's ready now to transhumanize. Um, another word that Dante coined 700 years ago and carries such different resonance now. It's become quite a word of the 21st century, but in the hands of the figures from Silicon Valley and elsewhere who feel that transhumanizing is embracing the material world more and more and more. Um, obsessed with the future and longevity, extending this life in its flatness, rather than as Dante uses it, which is to see increasingly how this world, how the created order shines with the more, shines with the spiritual. And in a way, you could summarize his journey through the paradise as learning how to tune in with more and more nuance, more and more finesse, which Beatrice almost titrates into his eyes, through her eyes and through her smile. The more he can tune into this subtlety, the more he finds himself in richer and richer, deeper and deeper, more intimate parts of reality, which is called paradise. And so he's able to work on his alignment with the source, with the divine. Um, it's a bit like, as Barfield noted, the way to read a poem is not to try and understand it too quickly, because that risks breaking it down, um, electrolyzing it. You might say to borrow one of Jeremy's words from his book in the shadow of the machine rather it's to to stay with its energy in its purest form and allow that energy to take you and to travel you bringing the intellect in so that you can follow and track the path but not so far that it's it not so harshly that it destroys the love that and the desire which must carry you um, they can work together, the love and the intellect, which Dante in Eden realizes that he can do with guidance, with help. Now, this is to half explain how I've come to understand these planetary spheres, um, which is that I think what Dante understood, and in fact, I think what C.S. Lewis came to understand as well in the Narnia stories, is that the planetary spheres, the planets in the heavens, share aspects of reality, shine with particular qualities of reality that we can know shining within ourselves too. And so they become guides because they help us to tune into what you might call the next step of our journey into wider and wider, deeper and deeper spheres and rings of being. And what happens is that as you know the light associated with the planetary sphere inside yourself, so you're spontaneously entering into that aspect of reality. And if you know the Paradiso, you know that that's how they travel through the heavenly spheres, in fact. Um, Dante does know that he's taking off from Eden at first, rushing towards the first planetary sphere of the moon. But... Um, very quickly, in fact, he suddenly finds himself in the next planetary sphere when he has understood, absorbed, um, allowed to become part of himself, the lesson of the previous planetary sphere. This is to say a very interesting thing, which I think we need to really wrestle with now, which is that metaphysics and cosmology coincide, um, if you're like me, um, you enjoy a bit of Platonic philosophy, 
it's quite in, it's it's attractive maybe not easy it's not quite the right word but it's attractive to focus on the metaphysics say of being to contemplate the nature of being in the abstract and to feel its light to feel its presence um, but Dante is saying to us that what's going on inside we must work on knowing as going on in the inside of the whole world to use Barfield's phrase so that our metaphysical contemplation can become a cosmological awareness once again too. Another way of putting this I think is to see that virtues aren't really about how we behave although they will undoubtedly affect how we behave they're far more fundamentally a way of knowing too. They are part of our epistemological apparatus um, that virtues are different from morality, put it like that. Um, morality is a sort of judge of what you're doing, how you're behaving. And, you know, sometimes that's for the good because we can do with these rather cruder guidance um, uh, systems in our lives, um, maybe more than on just occasion, but there's always this tremendous risk that morality demoralizes. I think that's very much what's happening in our culture at the moment with culture wars and so on, where uh, moral standards and desires even on either side are uh, very swiftly weaponized to destroy the other, to take them down, to cancel them. And I think that part of what's going on now is that we've lost this sense that virtues which are our personality traits, qualities of our character, who we are rather than what we do, they enable us to resonate with reality and so become a guide, um, a crucial part of our epistemology. And then I think we'll see unfold our metaphysical understanding resonating with our cosmological sight. And so the divine will shine through all that we see more and more and more. So let me just say a little bit now about how this unfolds step by step for Dante. He enters first the sphere of the moon. Oh. Yeah, thank you. And here's one of the wonderful images um, by Giovanni de Paolo that says a huge amount about what's going on. In summary, I think what he sees in the sphere of the moon is the first crucial lesson is that he must indeed learn to follow quality over quantity. They have a discussion, him and Beatrice, about why the moon shows light and shade. And Dante actually puts forward some quite good scientific ideas about that to do with density. Um, a higher density is darker and so on. And Beatrice says, no, 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 you've got to learn something different now. Um, you've got to learn that wherever there's light, regardless of its intensity, its quantity, you might say, it still carries the quality of the divine light. And so following quality, not quantity, is how we are going to make progress through paradise, through this way of knowing, through these states of mind. And that's shown up in the experiment that Beatrice describes, which is the chap there stood in front of the candle with the three mirrors, and the mirrors are at different distances. And Beatrice shows Dante that even though the intensity of the image fades with distance, that's the quantity way of understanding what's going on. The quality understanding is to know that they all shine with the same face, they all shine with the one light. And it sets up a wonderful theme that goes on through the paradise as well, which is about the nature of faces and how seeing the divine face is going to be the ultimate goal. Again, there's the wonderful Sufi way of putting this about how when we see with divine eyes, we see everything has the divine face. Um, it gets going here when Dante in the first sphere learns to begin to follow quality through life, not just quantity. And of course, that has massive resonance for now in a quantity obsessed culture. He finds himself in the next sphere, the sphere of Mercury. Here he meets Justinian in one of the medieval manuscripts kept in the Bodleian Library. And Justinian there in the middle in the middle it's a very rich set of cantos they all are and forgive me for touching on them and if I'm missing your favorite part um, but I think what he learns to do here having understood about quality is how to 
harmonize his qualities with the divine qualities. Justinian appears, he gives this great history of the world almost. And in this mercurial state, his light, Justinian's, is almost in a playful combat with the divine light. Um, uh, Dante describes rather beautifully how um, Dan uh, Justinian's light shines around him and sort of comes out of the background light and then fades back into it. And you get a sense that Justinian is loving his own glory a little bit too much, um, but he still hasn't lost touch with loving the divine glory. Um, he is on his journey through paradise as well and is learning how to um that his own glory can resonate with the divine glory again you know we're not robots um contrary to what many would want to tell us um if the divine is to be known inside us the divine dare i say within us must be um become conscious to us and that's something about how our light resonates with the divine light that happens in this mercurial sphere that's the second one they enter. Dante gets it and finds himself in the sphere of Venus, the third of the heavenly spheres. And here he learns almost the next step, the next part of this self-understanding um, by meeting amongst others, the wonderful figure of Cunitza. And he's quite surprised, I think, to meet her there because he knew in her in life, or certainly knew of her in life. And apart from how she ended her life quite in quite a holy way, um, she was well known to have had four husbands and many lovers as well. And Dante might have supposed that she would be somewhere on Mount Purgatory, um, working that out, but she's not, she's in paradise. And I think what Dante sees in her now is how the, what might be called promiscuity was actually divine abundance of love. And for all that she no doubt made mistakes in her life, um, which was why she perhaps had many husbands and lovers, at least in part, um, she never lost sight of how the divine generosity, the divine love shone inside her and so drew her to her lovers. Um, another figure they meet is Rahab, the whore of Jericho, as Rahab is sometimes called, um, who in the story of the Israelite conquest of Jericho lets the Israelites in. And you might say that Rahab, whatever else happened to her in the ancient profession, she never lost sight of being able to say yes to God, even as she had to say yes to many others. And so I think there's something about this riskiness of love that's celebrated in the paradise and is found celebrated by Dante in the sphere of Venus. And so he's finally able, perhaps you might say, to say yes to his own Eros that had so shocked him at Mount Purgatory that he'd had to enter the flames right at the top of Mount Purgatory in order to come to terms with. He's able to celebrate it now in all its fullness. That's what he learns in the third sphere amongst no doubt many other things. They come to this sphere now, the sphere of the sun, the, sun, the fourth. And this is a very fascinating sphere again. Um, it's the brightest star in our sky, um, shapes the day, of course, but it's a kind of pivotal sphere in this first part of the Paradiso. And I think that the characters that Dante meets here, um, the great luminaries of Christianity and indeed other traditions, is that they spoke brightly with their words in life, much as the sun shines brightly in our everyday consciousness of the waking day. And what they're learning here is that if they just followed the light of their words that little bit more, they would have seen that whilst these souls that gather around Dante and Beatrice disagreed in life, and often very severely, um, one of the figures there is this character, Seeger of Brabant, who was an Averroist, and Thomas Aquinas, who's the big guide and talks to Dante in this sphere, Thomas Aquinas declared Seeger a heretic in life, which is no mean accusation in the medieval world. But if they'd been able to follow the brightness of their own lights in life, they would have seen that through 
their light is the divine light the the passion with which they spoke needn't condemn others but can actually help them see how they're joined to others and this is a light which we need to wrestle with so much now collectively in a world of division um, to understand that division can be understood as passion can be understood as desire can be understood as yearning can be understood as flickerings can be understood as our own light and longing that can be understood as the divine light and longing and if only we can be with people in the, the heaven of the sun we might be able to understand that and so find how in our diversity there's a unity in fact dante begins to understand that i think in the light of the sun and it takes him into takes him into the sphere of mars next and what he learns there is about sacrifice again a lot happens in mars um, but he learns how the flow of life can be characterized as a sacrificial flow that what we receive we must give back um, it's this spiritual understanding of sacrifice if you like um, that is the self-sacrifice um, that when you know that your own light is but a faint reflection of the divine light you're able to constantly offer and surrender your own light in order that you may receive more and more of the divine light um, i i don't think william blake can be beat in his description of this realization which is his famous quatrain he who binds to himself the joy does the winged life destroy that's in a way what figures like thomas aquinas risked doing in life whereas he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise knowing that your own attempts to kiss the joy as it flies as your light meets the divine light is to live in eternity's sunrise which becomes the blaze of the sun and dante realizes that process more in the sphere of mars mars being a subtler light to us um, on earth but actually leading us into a truer sense of things that carries us that little bit further into paradise this is um, an insight picked up in other traditions as well which um, we discussed in another part of the perennial philosophy course when we read the bhagavad gita um, and this idea of acting without attachment to results and that's about this practice of staying in the present moment fully embracing the present moment it's, it's never a disengagement it's always a fuller engagement but without the attachment to results meaning that you're always free to move into the next moment and the next moment and the next moment and that's to fall into these wider spheres of being into the eternal moment um, which the Bhagavad Gita explores so well too. That's, I think, a lot of what's going in the sphere on in the sphere of Mars. They enter then the sphere of Jupiter, which those of you who know the Divine Comedy will recognize this wonderful image as part of that. This is the Eagle of Jupiter. And I put this particular image up because it's the moment when Dante is invited by Beatrice to look, or well, actually maybe it's by the eagle actually, um, to look into its eye and sees these characters in the eye of Jupiter who are sort of barely Christian at all, and some really aren't Christian at all. Um, there is Constantine with his deathbed conversion, but there's the Emperor Trajan, and then there's amongst the others this extraordinary figure of Ephaeus from um, the Trojan saga and i think this is the moment where dante really begins to see that christianity is a universal religion and he's a bit shocked and the eagle swoops around dante gleefully delighted to have given this great surprise to dante um, it's one of these lovely moments where your mistakes you almost sort of want them um, by now because you know they're going to lead you into deeper and deeper truth but what dante sees um, is that when we speak with our I, we can also speak with a we. And that's what he hears simultaneously in the sphere of Jupiter as these many souls speak. You can see how it's represented in this image with the many faces within the body of Jupiter, each playing their part, but they're playing their part so fully now, so richly, so wonderfully, that it spontaneously harmonizes into a whole. 
and so is the qualities of the Jupiter light, um, the old word for justice. Um, but just to stress, you know, this is no glib unity. Um, remember, you know, Dante's been through the inferno, he's been up Mount Purgatory. Um, this is understanding deeply and richly how all can be saved because all can be known everything can be said yes to it's not about that misunderstood notion of purgation which is interpreted as sort of cutting off slicing away getting rid of it's actually getting rid of that which disables us from saying yes to everything so that our vices become virtues and we resonate with the whole that, I think, is what Dante has understood in the sphere of Jupiter and so sees its results swooping and flying around him in the wonderful way that he does. And it brings him spontaneously to the sphere of Saturn. Now, I'm very conscious that as we reach, reach these high parts, um, I'm going to be skating over even more swiftly than I should and leaving much to mystery because I don't fully understand. Um, but this is sort of signal for Dante in the sphere of Saturn where he enters Saturn with Beatrice and all falls silent. And Beatrice tells him that the music's sounding, but he isn't able to hear it because it would be too shattering for him. And this theme of the faces comes up again in the sphere of Saturn when Benedict descends the ladder and he asks Benedict, whether he'll be able to see Benedict's face. And Benedict sort of goes, well, not quite yet. Um, and he's got to learn, I think, to see, first of all, his own face in its truest possible sense. That's partly what's going on in this very mysterious sphere of Saturn. Remember, Saturn is often associated with time and eternity um, in the ancient mythology. It's, uh, it's the beginnings of a transitional phase a boundary and that shows up for Dante as he must understand something about his own face in order to see the true faces of figures like Benedict and it comes up for him in the heaven of the fixed stars where he enters his own constellation um, of Gemini and I think what this is about is him beginning to understand how his face that was born into the world on his birth at this moment that the stars sung with him is also the face of the whole created order. Um, he has been welcomed by the whole of creation as he enters the sphere of the fixed stars in his place. He's finding that it radiates with the divine light all around him and sings with the divine light that was born in him at the moment of his birth. And so his physical mortal side is now grounded fully in the divine immortal side and you know that's what we feel on the occasions where we feel a sort of resonance with the world around us too um, when we know something of how our being is the shared being of all beings and so tips us into appreciations even if it's a, a swift glimpse of the divine being that is in all things, all people um, around and about us. Dante is getting some of that in the heaven of the fixed stars through his very personal, very intimate encounter with that domain in his own constellation. And then he enters the prima mobile, um, which is the place where the divine light, the divine motion is imparted to the created order. And he encounters Peter, James and John, and he practices and develops his own voice in this sphere, amongst other things, because he's asked by Peter and James and John to talk about faith, hope and love. And I think that's what this is about. It's a bit like the medieval practice of the disputatio, which is when you presented your thesis, you had not just to defend it, in the sense of making sure that it was consistent and rational and logical and well footnoted and all those things that you had to do today, you had to sing it so that your examiner's heart sang as well. And so something of the divine light came into the very room of your testing. And that's what Dante shows he's able to do in the prima mobile. 
he is able to sing with the fabric of reality now, to use Iris Murdoch's phrase. Um, and whilst he doesn't get it right straight away, um, he peers a bit too closely into John's face a bit too quickly. Um, and whilst commentators debate quite what this is about, I think he's, his, his love and his desire is always just sort of getting ahead of himself too. And so momentarily he's, he's blinded again in order to, as it were, the whole of him can kind of catch up with this desire in the moment. And so his sight is restored. Um, but then having already sung um, the lovely song of faith and hope, he sings the wondrous song, song of love and um, the apostles um, fly around him and Dante is crowned by John in the way that John had already crowned Beatrice. Um, I could easily go down the rabbit holes of all these illusions. They, it's, it's, you know, it's one of the, the marvels of the Divine Comedy, how this all comes together and leads me to the firm conclusion that it can only be inspired, um, but inspired because Dante was able to receive it and so sing of these things as well. It's his journey we're witnessing even in the text on the page. And so he comes to the Imperium. He catches a glimpse of the oneness of all things. Um, and it's like a white hole from which all things radiate, um, a boundless, infinite source um, that he glimpses first in Beatrice's eye and is beginning to be able to tolerate its, its light himself. And, you know, this is also reminding us that whilst this is Dante's transformation and it is his journey and his effort, his work, um, his mistakes, um, it's really just a response to the divine grace, to the divine outpouring. I think one of the things that becomes clear um, across the Divine Comedy is that Dante is giving a crucial nuance to Christian theology, which is that actually the fundamental act of God is always the same it is this outpouring it is the creative moment and that the particular parts of the christian story must always be understood in that light um, beatrice famously calls their journey and the whole of the story of creation from adam and eve through to um, the cross and resurrection and ascension she calls it a digression at this point um, and i think that's what she's saying you know that now we're here, see all as just another way in which God creates, just keeps on doing it. And we get confused a bit and interpret it in sort of half erroneous ways. Um, but now you can see um, that this diversity of history, this diversity of religious understandings and theology is really a unity too. They're beginning to understand that. And so Dante therefore sees the unity of the divine in that same moment. And so they come to um, the Imperium. Um, much could be said about this. Um, one can reflect on the last cantos of the Divine Comedy for a long, long time. And maybe the point is that we do frequently fall into silence and so just have to gaze. Um, that's what we're capable of this side of eternity. Um, but some crucial points, I think, are that you'll know that um, Mary and female saints increasingly feature at this, in this part of the divine comedy. And this has been seeded in our minds earlier down, not least with the three heavenly ladies. But I think that one of the things that Dante realizes in the figure of Mary is that much as she enwombed the divine, the divine enwombs us as well some crucial insights um peter damien explains this to him in the sphere of saturn there's some crucial insight in that and in my own understanding i was conscious that dante was contemporary with meister eichardt and then i remembered when we read meister eichardt in the perennial philosophy course as well and this understanding that eichardt had about the nature of detachment that we must bring all we are but in order to let go of it because in that moment of letting go, as consciously as we can of all that we are, we discover the uncreated source that was the origin of all that we are in his essay on detachment. That's something I think of what he's trying to communicate. And Dante's getting this now as he sees the Virgin Mary. It's very striking that whilst Bernard 
now prays to the Virgin Mary um, and celebrates the Virgin, but also actually celebrates Dante's life. It's like the two celebrations of these characters are coming together. Um, Mary doesn't actually respond. Um, she's already in this detached state, I think, which means that she's already fully divinely radiant. And Dante knows that now. He actually doesn't wait for Mary's response. He looks where Mary's looking. He's understood how the divine can be in wombed in him, but only really because he's always already in wombed in the divine. That's something of what Mary shows. And he knows too that the book of creation is bound by the book of love. These images start coming at us thick and fast. He knows the newness of this, this perpetual now um, with the image of Neptune, this famous story about how Neptune looked up from the depths of the Black Sea when Jason and the Argonauts sailed across it in the first ship and was bemused for centuries because um, he couldn't comprehend what he was seeing. Um, again, as Jeremy has so powerfully shown us in his book, In Shadow of the Machine, the significance of technology is not really the technology, it's the consciousness that it manifests. And Neptune was wrestling with this new technology, the ship, um, but Dante is wrestling um, with, in a way, what is the beginnings of the boundless journey now? Um, you know, this isn't really the end point. Um, it's in a way, a starting point, um, which is why Dante tells us more and more towards the end of the Divine Comedy that his words are going to fail, um, but they're only going to fail in order to let in more and more and more. Um, they are the cracks, which is how the light gets in, um, but needed. My goodness, they're needed because they've orientated us. They've helped us discern so much of this journey, um, which is what Dante has unpacked through the Paradiso and led to this moment where he is now spinning perfectly with the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So just in summary, you know, he's reached now this crucial insight that the fundamental nature of reality is abundance, not scarcity. My goodness, how much do we need to know that now? That it's generosity, not acquisitiveness and possessiveness. We need to know that not just in a moralistic way, but in the fullest epistemological way so that we can align with the generosity, with the abundance of all things. And, you know, with God's grace, radiate that into our world that has forgotten about abundance and generosity. We need the spirit of this rich ecology that Dante gives us in the Paradiso. Um, it's one but it's a dancing, spinning, diverse, glorious one. And we need that, not the spirit of the machine that divides. And we need to remember that this is all called a comedy. Um, it has this delightful, rich ending, not because it's turned its back on the tragedy, but because it's embraced the tragedy. You know, Dante has been through the inferno. He's been to the place that's so low, it almost doesn't exist at all. And because with Virgil, with the three heavenly ladies, with the divine grace, because he was able to bring the light to that place. So he was able to rise to the source of the light as well. I'll pause there and I hope we've got time for some further comments and reflections and questions. But thank you very much for listening.